In each Masters of Beautiful Achievements Academy episode, Alexander Princeton interviews guests about how solutions inspired by nature can provide sustainable opportunities for our future challenges. Since 2013, he is globally researching sustainable business models and innovations. To share his findings, he founded the Masters of Beautiful Achievements Academy. Welcome to this edition of the Masters of Beautiful Achievement series. In this session, I'll be talking with Anders Nyquist about education, creativity in relation to the circularity of our economy. Anders is an architect whose inspiration by nature has motivated him to create creative, purposeful buildings and projects. He calls this eco-cycle design. His clients are all over the world and he calls his home Sweden. Anders, it's an honor to have you in this session. I'm happy to be here. Since we met in 2014, you planted a very important seed uh, inside of my brain. Um, and that was about the need to provide sustainable perspective for change agents all over the world on our uh, future challenges. Could you share with us why this is so important for you? I think it's, uh, it's a question of survival for the humanity on the globe. If we can't understand how to live together with new nature, I think it's impossible to survive in the future. For there are so many problems we have to solve together on the globe. And the whole humanity need to work together and work together with nature, in balance with nature, otherwise we haven't a future. And, and, and why is the balance with nature so important? Because you, always, you also have people who are saying we are already living in balance with nature. Yeah, uh, but we are not living in balance with nature. The Western way of building cities is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's time to reflect about uh, what the way, how the way is uh, to, to reach a sustainable future in the built cities, but also in the new cities. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in, in Africa today, there are 1.2 billion people living. Mm -hmm. And within uh, 25 to 30 years, it will be 2.4 billion people living in Africa. So that's two it's, times more. Yeah. And it means that during 20 or 30 years, we need to build 601 million cities uh, in Africa. In, in 20 years? In 20 to 30 years to meet that uh, the, the, the demand for, from the African people. And if we are still building them in the Western way, there is not possible for a survival. For you know already in South Africa, mm -hmm. the, the, the lack of water. They have very little water and they are using the same Western wastewater treatment systems that we have done for 150 years, and they are not sustainable. So we need to think over the way how we shall plan our cities. And we must plan them so we have enough of food, mm -hmm. uh, we have enough of uh, relations to other people and to, to feel that we are living safe. And we are not doing that uh, with the planning methods we are using today. No, I, I remember reading reports that cities are actually uh, one big heat absorbing uh, spatial area. The heat doesn't get away from the cities, it concentrates the heat. Yeah. Uh, so like a, 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 a concrete, cities are becoming one, one basic, basically one big uh, desert. Mm -hmm. where there is no life, uh, less yeah. green. Mm -hmm. um, and I even read a report that the oxygen on top of cities, the oxygen levels are lower now than 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if, if I understand these scientific reports, then the need to change is, becomes drastic. Yeah, and I think my vision for future cities in Africa or all over the world is what we can call ruralization instead of urbanization. Now we, are, yeah. now we are always talking about urbanization, mm -hmm. big, build, bigger cities, uh, higher with, uh, for more and more people. But I think uh, if you are thinking in a totally different way uh, with the city planning, it's possible to build a city for 40,000 people in, in an area of two by two kilometers in one store buildings. And it means that in the northern part of Europe, 
you need about uh, 10 by 10 kilometers to be totally self-sufficient with food, energy, water, wastewater treatment and building material and so on. So this is something we had to change our mindset mm -hmm. about planning cities. So if you have a, a, a small city with 40 inhabitants, then you have all the service you need. It's on walking distance between all the, what you need for the daily life. Uh, and it's self-sufficient with food. And this is so important. And now we are discussing how can we educate the, the coming generations to solve this uh, way of living, to, to have another standard for living. So I'm working together with people on El Hierro, the small island in the Canary Islands, where we are planning a new type of universities for young people who want to be self-sufficient and live a better life uh, and change the, t the total mindset for living. And this is so interesting. For in the future, mm -hmm. uh, also well-educated children will see that it's not so much job on the market for the automatization of a lot of productions means that fewer people are involved in the creating new jobs. But the need of uh, the simple things is the need of food, need of water, need of shelter and need of energy. If you can uh, t manage to find solutions for that, then you can live a happy life in the future. Don't work so much. Uh, That's most uh, people would, would love to yeah, do that. <laughs> yeah, and I have tried it uh, during 25 years when we were living all year round in our village, in the Rumpan village in, uh, outside Sundsvall in Sweden. And, and what, is, what is special about Rumpan village? It, yeah, it's uh, what you call an eco-village. I don't use that uh, n name, but uh, for be very short, I say it's an eco-village. Mm -hmm. We started it, my wife and I and uh, some relatives, we started it 50 years ago. 50 years 50 ago? 50 years really? ago. Oh, be wow. Before we had all the beautiful... Uh, words as uh, sustainability <laughs> and uh, closing the loops and all. Mm -hmm. So we wrote a program based on a social vision. Mm -hmm. The social vision w was based on the same way of living as I have seen when I grew up uh, in a fisherman's village outside the coastline of Sweden, where everybody was individual, yeah. but we need to survive on an island uh, year, all year around, you need to cooperate with all the other people when you need help. And this was the basic idea for, for our village. But it, we also wrote down uh, that we wanted to live in balance with nature, what we call ecolo ecological buildings or villages nowadays. And we also have a vision for the technical solution. Mm -hmm. We wanted to figure out what is the best available technology in the world that we can implement in our village. And it should also be made of local material. And it should also have a, a low uh, yearly cost. The economy, uh, together with uh, the other things, must be uh, also affordable for normal people. So our village, it's 25 families living together, and uh, we, we, it's built by amateurs. Yeah, you no, profession, <laughs> no professionals have built it. So I train people, and they trained each other, and now we have a village for more than 100 people living together. And there we also have had our, we still have our office and uh, the office is also eco-cycle adapted. So, so basically what you, you were just saying is creating an eco-village between brackets, because everybody thinks about eco-village yeah, yeah. people with um, long beards, hippies. Yeah. But, uh, uh, your, but, vi your village yeah. is completely different. Yeah, no, uh, it's normal people yeah. who, who, who want to live in a safe and uh, uh, sustainable way. So we have our own water supply, we have our only wastewater treatment, 
We can get the energy from the, from the forest, from the firewood. We have a windmill in the neighborhood of the village producing electricity. And we have farmland so we can survive, we can grow our own food. And we have the ocean with a lot of fish. So uh, if all my grandchildren have problem in the future, they can move to that place and they can survive by just use the resources we have locally. This is blue economy when it's best. What is blue economy? Blue economy is to use the resources you have close to the place where you are living. And in a blue economy society, there are no waste products. Uh, in nature, there is no waste. Yeah, that's, that's something we have been sh sharing with my listeners for a long time already. Yeah, so uh, when a tree f uh, are dry and fall, uh, fall off in the nature, yeah. it's a starting point for a new life. It's not uh, garbage or waste or whatever we normally call it uh, in, in, in the Western, Western world. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, this is very, very simple. And uh, when we started to, to run our own business, my wife and I, mm -hmm. we moved out to the countryside to the small summer house and we added some more uh, room for us and we built the office. And then we also decided that it's possible to live in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. we, I had been managing director for a consultant company in Sweden with 100 employees. And my salary was very good. And my wife had a state uh, 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 a job for, for the state and was also well paid. And we said, in the rest of our life, we shall uh, uh, half our income from what we had earlier. And we shall only work half time. We wanted to be free during the mm -hmm. summers. And we could be together with our children and our grandchildren. This is so important in the, that part of, of my life. So we tried to do that. And my wife, she had a very good control of the, the cost for the family. For We have been married for a very long time. And we saw that there were three parts of our economy that took all, all the money. It was the house. Yeah. It was the car and the food. Always the car in there. Yeah. <laughs> so... If we uh, lower the cost for these three parts, mm -hmm. then we can live a sa simpler life. And we could prove it uh, by trying it ourselves. And we made a calculation model. Mm -hmm. We call it a time cost calculation. You can uh, calculate how many hours do you need to work uh, with, in, with an income and see if, how you are using that income for these three parts, for the house, for the car, and for, for, for the food. And we had the office uh, 10 meters from our home, so it's on walking distance. That sounds, so, that yeah. sounds very beautiful. And we, <laughs> use, and we use the car when we have to go to clients, and the clients paid for me yeah. to go to the client. And then there was very low cost for the car. And then we produced half of our food uh, ourselves. We were fishing, we were growing vegetables. We have a greenhouse yeah. in front of our office. So we can produce food also in winter time. Yeah, it makes me wonder how, how tough is it to do, to transition the way you've, you've done with your wife and family? Mm? How Pardon? difficult is it? Because most, peop most people say, most easy, people say it's you, easy. Can, you cannot it's, transition. It's easy. Decide, have a, have a goal mm -hmm. for your way of living. Uh, I think that's so important. So sometimes when I've been educating students at the university in Sweden, I said one of the things that they have to do is to write down, uh, sit down for first of all and dream. What kind of life do you want to have in the future? Where are you, wh where are you really want to live? Where are you, uh, the way of living? What kind of work do you want to do? What kind of friends? And also, yeah, the total life. Uh, think it so you can see it for your inner eyes. Interesting. I, I have, I'm teaching now also. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
these are really tough questions for the younger generation. Yes, but I think it's time to reflect about what kind of life is it a commercial old-fashioned way to live. Mm -hmm. More income, you better you are. Uh, and you, the more money you have when you die, uh, <laughs> you're happy, you perhaps can be. But this is a totally different way of thinking. Yeah. So, and what are you experiencing from the feedback from your students? The, the feedback for the, from the students are uh, sometimes very, very interesting. So I tell them that they shall see it for the inner eyes and then go to their table and write down the story, the story about themselves in the future. And I think this is the starting point on a very, very interesting journey to the future. So if you have a clear vision mm -hmm. where to go, then you have a direction. And if you haven't a direction, then you are go, uh, walking around in the cities, shopping, shopping, and shopping. So that's not life. Life is something totally different. Mm -hmm. That's the social vision for your own relations to other people, to your family or whatever, to nature, to whatever you do. And, and I think if we go back, I've been working as an excavator and architect for uh, archaeological excavations. Um, we were digging out a Bronze Age city in, in Cyprus. And I was thinking about what, what's the life in a, in, a, in a city on the Bronze Age with 10,000 inhabitants. Yeah, which, is, which is so much smaller than we do now. Yeah, it's, it's a big city. And this was a big city close to Larnaca in, in Cyprus. And they li live in balance with nature. Well, they have the energy, they have the building material, they were using clay bricks, uh, mud bricks uh, for building the houses, and the wooden stuff that they can find in the surroundings. And they have the food, they have the energy, everything. And very interesting, how many hours do you think they are working to get food, uh, clothes, uh, whatever they need for their daily life? Um, knowing you, Anders, that would be half that we're doing now. But I can imagine a lot of people would say it's much, it's very high because you, you, you're constantly working the whole day to get your um, basic needs. Four hours. Four hours Four a day. Four hours a day for a growing up f to get the food, to have the, build the houses. And then they have 20 hours to be social with their friends. What a, what a fantastic life. If you think about a normal European family, as you are two young persons, you are living in, in, in a, a suburb to a big city. It takes you at least one hour to take you to get to, to the job. Then you are working four hours. Then you have one hour lunch. Then you are working four hours. And then, then you have at least one hour more to come back. How many hours are the wo working day for you? 11 hours, perhaps 12 hours. And if you live close to the place and work close to the place where you are living, you are saving time, time that you can be using for mm. other things. So I can't understand why we uh, choose to live in suburbs to big cities uh, and spoil our life. Uh, commuting and do nothing. Look at, your, at the uh, roads in, in Holland. One person in one car, three lines in both directions. Completely full, yes. It's, we have huge traffic jams in the mornings and the yeah, afternoons. Yes. So I make an other choice. Yeah. I left a small city, moved to the countryside where I was more, more or less self-sufficient. And then I could do the job I really wanted to do. I could say no to a job that was not uh, exciting enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and we said that we should only work with uh, green projects, if you call it uh, green projects, uh, in Sweden and all over the world. And we are happy that we are looking back now that this was possible for us. So a drastic change is possible, but you, it's important that you have a vision in which direction you You need a vision. Yeah. Otherwise, you have no di direction. Yeah, I know. There's an interesting saying from uh, Alice in Wonderland. 
when mm. she's at a yeah. uh, cross point and she asked uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, images in the in the movie um, which direction should I take and the question was which where do you want to know, ha- go to mm-hmm. I don't know then both choices are good mm-hmm. yeah. so if you don't but it's 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 hard for a lot of people to be to know what they want because it's not what we've been taught yeah uh, and school, there's, school. there's another thing I used to tell my children and my grandchildren that uh, from my in, uh, my own experience take the train when it's coming when you are standing on the platform and it's coming a train take the train don't ask where are you going what's the end station but if you have a chance to do something exciting do it when the, the, you have the possibility next day perhaps the the it's lay down or you haven't the, the chance again so this is also something that we are it's very difficult for people to change when they have uh, established on on a site then they have very it's what it's very difficult to make a change we have my family we have all, always think about that mm-hmm. take the chance now you never know if it's a chance in the future no, that reminds me of uh, uh, what was it the movie like you never know what kind of chocolate you're going to get from the box mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> so it was interesting um, look, looking back to your products uh, projects uh, Anders um, th- when I researched it and you explained to me when I was in Sweden it 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 feels that there is the common sense you just described in the tradition you made. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've been integrating various systems in your architectural mm-hmm. project. What, what is the connection to eco-cycle design and how does it fit into the bigger picture? I think, first of all, when we are making a new project, we educate all those who are involved in a project. So you, from, from the decision makers on the top level, all the way to those who are handling the project, and then also the worksmen working on the site. Everybody who are involved in our project must have a background, so, they, so we speak the same language. The next step for us is to write a program to, together with the client, and then we do it uh, in the client's knees. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we move to the place where uh, they are going to build the, the buildings or planning the, the cities. And then we are discussing, first of all, the social vi- vision for the project, the kind of life that you are offering in your project. Mm-hmm. If it's a one-family house, uh, I must know if I should design the building the way the family is living. And it's also if it's a commercial building or if it's a block of flats or whatever, you must have an idea, a vision for what kind of life do you think you will offer within uh, that building. And my job is to make the shell Mm -hmm. around the social vision. And then we are talking also about, uh, in the program, about the ecological vision. And this is to figure out how can we design a building with less footprints in in nature. And then the technology, the, the technical vision, where can we find the best available technology in the world? And then I'm working together with the, the CERI organization, Zero Emission and Research Institute, together with Günther Pauli. And I can drop an email to him and say, I have this problem. Where can we find the best solution for that problem? And then within 24 hours, I have been connected with a man in Madagascar or whatever. <laughs> whatever. And uh, so we can together solve the problem. And this is, we are working with open sources. It means that we, are, we, we can uh, tell other people our experience from mm-hmm. what we have done, the, the good things and the bad things. So this is so important. And then when we are talking about the, uh, the technical vision, we talk about the economical vision. And the economical vision is not only the investment cost. It's uh, more or less the, the most important thing is the yearly cost or the life cycle cost. Mm-hmm. 
And we know from our projects that they perhaps are 10% more expensive than ordinary ordinary buildings. Yeah. But already the first year, we can guarantee that it's at least 10% cheaper, the running cost. But the society today gives uh, a gold medal for those who are building the cheapest houses. Uh, and the cheapest houses is not only, uh, always the cheapest, the lowest running, running cost. So this is the way that we start. And then in combination with uh, very uh, important calculations for, for the site, we must know about the site and mm -hmm. also the local culture. If we are working in a totally different uh, country, you must know the local culture. Otherwise, you can't design a building in that environment and the local climate and yeah, all the technical uh, information you can get from the site. So this is the start. So most of the architects, uh, they start by, when they get the project, they start designing the building. And it's impossible to design a building if you don't can look upon the social vision, ecological vision, the technical vision, the economical vision. So we are, when we are starting to design a building, we are sitting together with our clients across a table and I make the small sketches and then we can decide. Uh, so we are not using computer-aided design. We are using our brains and our pencil. And here comes common sense around the corner. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting. I've, I've, at least in the Netherlands where I'm living at the moment, there is a, a huge debate and dialogue on uh, retrofitting the built environment. Mm -hmm. And it, interesting enough, um, what you mentioned, Anders, is that um, they are, everybody tends to go for the lowest cost, but every, everybody for, forgets the running cost. And mm -hmm. What I've understood is that they're both different budgets. Mm -hmm. So the one who's procuring or building the mm -hmm. house, they invest in the bricks, but yeah. they don't care about the running cost, yeah. which, mm -hmm. which I explain them from a systemic point of view, yeah. how you could design a building also from the inspiration you gave me. Mm -hmm. And they look at me like, mm, yeah, I know you're right. But we work differently. <laughs> yeah, yes, and, and I meet also that comments, and I think that uh, to retrofit the the built society is very, very important. And I think it's possible. It's possible to do it, but you must think it in a total way to rethink it and try to figure out what's the best for for the for the the, the life cycle cost and for. Yeah, the total uh, to, total idea about the house. Yeah, and, and then what to do what to do with the stuff you take out? Of course, you need to th put that oh, back yeah. into a cir yeah. circle. Yeah, uh, and interesting, what the way you're you're, you're talking about architecture and, and basically before you start, you teach <laughs> to make sure that yeah. everybody yeah. speaks a common yeah. language, which which is a which is an interesting approach. Um, and also the worksmen on the site, mm -hmm. which is also very important. We know that from some of the projects that uh, they can't read my specification in drawings. <laughs> for yeah. the, it's sometimes uh, made in a, in a different way than they are used to do. Mm -hmm. But if I explain that you have to do it in that way, otherwise we will have humidity in the walls or whatever it could be. So this is so important. Do you, do you reckon that the common sense in the workforce is much higher than those who are uh, uh, being your, your, let's say, your contractors or your uh, clients? No. When I explain this way of working, they understand that this is important. Mm -hmm. okay. And they are, uh, and from the managing point of view, this is saving money. Yeah. It goes faster and People are happier, it's cleaner on the workplace, and so on. So we know that it's working. So basically, you sh you're showing the cash, and when they see yeah, the cash, yeah. then, then you say, okay, Anders, go, go ahead, we want this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that, because that, that debate tends to still be in the current paradigm, what I'm, what I'm used to when I'm advising mm -hmm. companies. And, and, when, if, and if, once you want to transition them to the new paradigm, there's a lot of teaching to be done because, Ooh, yes. because yeah, they, yeah, they, they find, yeah. find it very hard to see the whole yeah, yeah. system within the part. 
But we need good examples, and that's uh, the, the, the best way to convince people. And that's, we are happy that we have so many projects that we can show our new clients and say, we did it in that project, and it, uh, we have positive or negative uh, <laughs> results <laughs> from the project. But we can show them that it uh, is possible to do it. So we need good examples. Yeah, and I know you have a really nice example in the northern of uh, Sweden uh, with the green... Green zone. Yeah, yeah green yeah. zone. Yeah. Can, you, can you share a little bit on that? What, 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 yeah. what makes it unique? Uh, it was built 20 years ago. So, so it, to, this year we have a 20, 20 years anniversary and we will have a seminar in September uh, celebrating, c- celebrating it. it. And uh, I met a client who wanted uh, the best available technology in the world. Okay. And uh, this was the starting point. He had never built a house before. <laughs> he had a he, vision. He had a, he had a vision. And he was uh, running a car dealer shop. Mm-hmm. And he uh, wanted to build uh, a block where he can assemble uh, some of the buildings uh, with connection to the car industry. Not production cars, but to serve, give service for, for the cars, mm-hmm. but also fast food. Uh, it's a McDonald's in, in the block. And there is a, a petrol station. And these three buildings, uh, a, a, a car a shop uh, with the mechanics and everything what they need, they are the, the three worst polluters in, in the wastewater treatment system in the municipality. We have no connection to the wastewater treatment system. They are off the grid. Off grid, yeah. And they are self-sufficient with energy for the McDonald's restaurant. Uh, we have a heat exchanger for the, the restaurant and uh, they are uh, producing so much energy that we can heat all the buildings in the block. We can also heat 5,000 square meter more uh, if we have more buildings in the surroundings from, from the kitchen in the McDonald's. And this is 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And this is the only McDonald's in the world. There are 25,000 McDonald's in the world. And this is the only uh, McDonald's selling hamburgers and energy. And the same for the petrol station. They have a lot of freezers and fridge and so on that needs a lot of energy. And we also take care of that energy. And we can store it in the ground by boreholes. So during the summers, we are storing it in the boreholes and we can reuse it in the winter. So they are self-sufficient with with energy mm-hmm. and uh, the the storm water we are taking care storm water is a big problem in cities but we are taking care of all the storm water we have used uh, the best available building material and uh, we know from uh, 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 doctors uh, what do you call it uh, do, uh, yeah in Swedish? Yeah, <laughs> doctors of handling, right? The doctors thesis. thesis. Uh, she, it was a lady who she made a, a calculation for the project. It was 17% more expensive than an, if you compare it with an ordinary building. And it was 10% cheaper the first year. And now we know that it's still cheaper. And another thing very important, this is the own... Uh, the, the car dealer in Sweden uh, that has less uh, 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 sick, uh, sick leave. So the people in the building are much healthier. And in the building we, for example, use uh, living the plants as a part of the ventilation. We have termite ventilation for the intake of the air. And uh, that's very simple things. It's all, again, common sense. If you use the best available technology, it's, it it's must be better for the building and for the people who are working in the building. I have just a question. What do you do with... with you said they were also off the grid for their water. Yeah. Uh, how, how are you cleaning that? We, we have an infiltration for the grey water okay. on the land. 
And then we take care of, uh, we have uh, vacuum toilets, so there is very little water, less than one liter per, per yeah. flushing. And this is the only thing that is not working, for this was something that the municipalities sh should take care of, for they wanted to make energy from from the black water. Yeah, and the, what, what is black water? Uh, yeah, from the toilets. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but uh, this was the only thing that was not working from the very beginning. And this was what the municipality uh, should do. And make a biodigester yeah, out of it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, this was the idea. So that it could have some more, so it would have more energy yeah, from that. Yeah, yeah, That was 20 years ago. On 20 years ago. And now they are like still seeking for the holy grail to turn these these uh, industrial areas around the cities into zero zero emission and zero waste places so they have to go to sweden yeah if they want to see such a uh, building uh, so it's easier to go there and look around yeah, it's it's amazing that these examples are there out there in yeah, the world yeah. you need, just need to know where to look mm. and also i can mention the lagerbay school outside sonsval where uh, the whole school is eco-cycle adapted and they are using the school as a part of the education of the children in the school. I think mm -hmm. this is also a very good idea. Oh, a school? A school. The building is, is the teaching for the children yeah, yeah, what they in, learn. In, in sustainability. Yeah. Okay. So they, they have all these installations also that we are done. And the, the, we, we made it, it's more than 25 years ago now. Now, I'm just nodding my head like, oh man, if, if people would just know where to find for this and just use their common sense, then things could be so much yes. healthier for everybody. Yeah. And they, uh, I think that's the reason why we need to show good examples. And we have tried to do it uh, uh, with the project we have done, but uh, it's not easy to convince people for they are... They have not the overall uh, view of the projects. Mm -hmm. For people in, in, in such a project, they are uh, educated to take care of a small, small piece of the project. Yeah. But very few people have an overall view of the, the system. For this is typical, typical system design. When you're thinking that a part of the construction is a part of the energy system. If you choose the right material, you have uh, also solved the problem about energy, for example. So basically, uh, the two thoughts co are coming up to me, Anders. One of them is, I tend to have the idea that architects are v the very few systems thinkers in society, um, and, and they have a sort of a role to play in here. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, the way you approach a, uh, a project that you mentioned, first you teach and then you go through the social, ecology, technical and the economic. Um, if you, I have been talking to some uh, construction companies and you mentioned they're, they're only working on one part of the whole building. Mm -hmm. And when I show them, if you put all the different parts together, your business model, your business case or your business proposition changes completely mm -hmm. yeah. because the service you offer are part of a, of a bigger, bigger chain or a bigger system. Um, so, so th those are the two reflections I have. What I found interesting, what, is you, what would you be your advice as an architect with, with, a, with a systems thinking uh, mind to construction companies? I think it's very important, uh, as we did in, in uh, the Green Zone project in Umeå in Sweden. We were sitting together with the client, with all those who are involved in, in the building concept from the very beginning. We were writing the program together. So mm -hmm. the, co the construction people, the HVAC people, the electricians, the uh, uh, people working with the green areas around the building, everybody was sitting, one person around the table. And we are having an open discussion. What can we do together with the, the, the experience? Normally, when you make a project in Holland or Sweden, you, you point out an architect and he makes the design. Then uh, uh, people from the construction company said that it should be steel or concrete or whatever in the construction. And then uh, the, you have the HVAC people saying that we need our big installations in the roof and the, 
the, the, the ceiling is lower and lower depending on how big the, the ventilation, system, ventilation yeah. system is. <laughs> and then you have the electricians at the end uh, making all the wires uh, in the building. But we are sitting down together with everybody from the very beginning. And when we are discussing, so they can say, I have been doing a project earlier that we did and that, and it was a good, good example that we could cooperate. So this is also a, a sort of system thinking when you co co connect people with each other early in a... Yeah, and then, then, and then you shall also take the responsibility. And today, mm -hmm. very few architects are uh, taking care of the buildings when it's finished. Uh, we are always going to our project every year to see what's working, what's not working, what can we learn from uh, earlier projects. And I think we, we have a lot of things to learn from, from what we have done, but also what uh, we can learn from already built buildings. I think the old buildings in the Western society have a lot of things to teach us. So th the buildings we can see in a society, are, we say they are beautiful and so on. And I think they are uh, still there and in use, depending on they have a, a quality. Yeah. They have uh, uh, good materials. They have a f f the functional lifespan. And they have all the positive things that we can still use them and reuse them and all yeah. bad buildings are taken down yeah so what we see is the best buildings and we have to protect them and learn from them yeah there's an interesting paradox anders when you, everybody likes the old cities mm -hmm. because of because of the arguments you're giving yeah and yet we live in all these suburbs which are all uh, mechanicized and technical mm -hmm. and 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 the the soul of the building is gone yeah that's why i like old buildings because you can feel mm. there is life in the building but I, I used to say that the modern uh, blocks of flats is a storage for people during the night you go into <laughs> you go into the entrance and take the elevator go into your flat lock it with the, the security locks and then you are living there as, as in a prison People who are living in such buildings, they don't know their neighbors. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and we have tried to build other type of mm -hmm. block of flats. We have one up in Umeå, where we have a green room in the middle of the building, and its balcony is on both sides of the green room. And when people come into the building, they, uh, then they are at home. And then they walk up to their balcony, uh, a oh, balcony inside or inside, outside? Yeah, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then they take off the shoes on the balcony and they open the door and leave it open. It means I'm at home. Do you want to take contact with me? Do that. And they have an, a private balcony close to the entrance door. So they in, in the evenings they can sit. I've been living in that house. Then you can talk with... The, another family uh, in, in the basement uh, and ask them what have you done today and so on. And I have also seen that people in that building helping each other. So uh, young families ask the old people living in the house, uh, I'm going to the, to the grocery store, shop, do you need something? I can buy it for you uh, if you take care of my children. Yeah, but you, you know how that sounds, Anders? Like people are always on holidays. Yeah, yeah. So it's holiday inside yeah. your own city. Yeah. And if you have this green room in the middle of the yeah. house uh, and living close to the Arctic Circle, you have still uh, a, a vision of a beautiful summer day <laughs> when, <laughs> when you're sitting together with your neighbors with the palm trees or whatever you have around you and, have, and palm trees inside of the building yeah, yeah, in the yeah, in yeah. in up north in sweden yeah, yeah. you can grow palm trees yeah, yeah. so we can have our own gardens yeah gardens of and you can also grow food so ne the next uh, vision we have for this type of building yeah. is to grow food inside the, that building and with the aquaponic you can also grow fish uh, and uh, fish and vegetables 
in in that green room at the same is a, a relaxed room for those who are living in the building yeah, i think we had earlier we had niklas wenberg mm -hmm. uh, in, yeah. in the podcast and he explained me that he now has two projects from municipality of gutenberg and Malmö yeah. to actually yes. integrate yeah. his systems yeah in a local uh, Ooh, yeah. building block but uh, if you build it uh, so you also help people to live in a different way the so all again the social vision for the way you are living it's not a storage of people yeah, yeah. it's it's a way of living together so if if, if you mention storage of people and I'm, I'm i'm just thinking also about my conversations with local governments um especially social housing mm -hmm. they have a target they have they have a number of houses and basically they think in storage of people that's sort oh, of that's, that, that's business that's model yeah so just now I'm also involved in a project which is, I think it's very interesting. It's to build together with refugees, let them uh, be uh, introduced in the Swedish society by building their own houses so they can live cheaper in their own houses. So they can be proud of, I coming to a new country, I have allowed the building technology in the country and I live in my own small house. And this is... A totally different way to integrate uh, refugees. We tried it in Holland also, but uh, they, they haven't continued to do it. I have now done a project in Sweden mm -hmm. that we hopefully can see a result within a couple of years. Yeah, you, your colleague Walter Stahl, uh, he's mm -hmm. a professor in uh, Switzerland and he's, he's the promoter of the performance economy mm -hmm. and his vision is to own nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I'm living in Rotterdam in uh, in an area where you have lo uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, people are not co originally coming from the Netherlands mm -hmm. and they are proud to own something because if you're an immigrant, um, creating value for yourself mm -hmm. and your community is so important. So it's an interesting contradiction that, that on one side, the, the uh, performance economy of the people who say ownership doesn't exist, we, we hire and rent everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the other side, owning something has also to do with a lot of with pride and uh, yes. aspirations. But you can also be proud of being involved in a project where you are living. So what we are talking about is tiny houses, mm -hmm. really small areas. And for example, in Sweden nowadays, a lot of young people, they are standing out of the com common uh, 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 market for, for flats. They haven't enough of money to buy the, their flats. And we made the calculations for this project. So two, if two students work uh, eight hours per day, they can build their own house within two months. And they have uh, uh, the monthly cost is only 20% of an ordinary flat in the Swedish society. 20% it's so cheap. For example, my office, it's uh, one, which one? The, the one up in Sundsvall, yeah. the, the earth-covered house. Uh, it, it's 125 square meter. Yeah. And the cost per month is one third of a student's flat in, in Sweden. I think a lot of, a lot of professionals would then have the, your house as an office. Mm, yeah. Cheap, cheap office, office space. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a cheap way. But I have done it myself. Yeah. I built it myself. And I think if we can build our uh, village, Rumpan village, with amateurs, it's possible to train students to build their students' flats uh, in one stored building in, in a small, small building and make it uh, uh, in, in a very, very uh, good way. And then, then I sort of hear sort of like one of my listeners. Yeah, what about regulations, building regulations? Yeah, why, why not? We, we yeah. shall follow the regulations, but uh, if, if we build it's better than they usually do. Mm -hmm. we, we are talking about passive housing, okay. houses without a need of electricity. Oh, that, that, that sounds really And with, with uh, their own wastewater treatment, biological wastewater treatment. We don't need any connection to the wastewater uh, mm -hmm. connections. And for example, here in, in Holland, you have problem with the water. You, you have problem with leaking uh, wastewater treatment pipes. And they are polluting the, the water table. Yeah. And you have salt coming in from the ocean to your water table. 
So you, ha you have really problem with the water. So if you can have totally different toilet system, you, you, we, we now talking about ordinary toilets and so on, but mm -hmm. biological cleaning, so you can reuse the water. We designed a project in, in China where we also use the roof of the small buildings uh, as a cleaning place for the wastewater. We pump it up, uh, the black water, oh, really? the grey water, and then we clean it in with the flowers and... Uh, okay, yes, yeah. so you have uh, and then, plants, yeah. yeah. And then we put reuse the water for uh, flushing the toilets. So we have a close small, system. closed system. It's that easy. Yeah, very easy. Be and beautiful. Yeah, the green, the green, green, roofs green, roofs are, green roofs are always beautiful. Yeah. That's something we are missing in, uh, in a lot of cities. Yeah. Anders, this is, uh, I'm getting goosebumps. This is uh, another, another conversation about common sense and creativity and don't think in, uh, what is it, what they say, don't think in problems. Solutions, think in possibilities. Think in possibilities and, and, and don't, don't let yourself down that things cannot be done. Because mm. I think you, you've now given like five or six examples. The last one I like because that would turn the building, the building industry completely upside down. Mm -hmm. if, yeah, you, suddenly we have plants which bring back the water cycle on the cities and we have more mm -hmm. uh, 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 was it respiration of the plants and mm -hmm. more yeah. oxygen. Yeah. I only see plus, 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 plus. Mm -hmm. But it's... Um, and common sense. And common sense, yeah. <laughs> and, and common sense. And uh, it's, uh, as you said, education. If, if you know where to look for this information, you mm. know that it exists yeah. and then you have the examples. Mm. Um, every time I close uh, these uh, always inspiring uh, sessions with the question, what kind of suggestions would you have for my listeners uh, where they can look up more information on, on the mindset you're providing, on uh, uh, YouTube movies or, or books they should read? I think uh, there are so many good examples uh, spread all over the world. So you, you can find uh, the good examples everywhere. But it's easier to talk about the, the bad things and the problems in the future. But we need to focus on, on the positive things, uh, the good examples. And they are all over, all, all over the world. And you can also go back to the... Uh, really old societies where you can find, find people living in close connection to nature and they survive and had a happy life and have time to live. Yeah, I'm, smi I'm smiling while you're saying that. There was a, there was a, there was a, a research I've done on, on passive building, but also on um, clay is a very good insulator. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that in Persia, they were already making ice in the desert, mm -hmm. which was, which was, pure physics, logic, mm. and these ha houses were, were 21, 22 degrees inside, where it was on the outside, 40 degrees. Yeah, and, and also had, you can go back to the Pharaoh's t time, oh, yeah. where, where they have termite ventilation, uh, that dig down in, in, in the soil and use the cooling from that. And this is what they are, have been doing for thousands of years in the Arab countries also. And now we think that this is unique but it's common Co sense common sense <laughs> yes now th so much thank you Anders for uh, having uh, having you on the show today and um, I'm getting goof goof goosebumps because I've learned again so much uh, because of listening to you and having all these examples so thank you for, again for that now th this was it Join me for next time on a new Masters of Beautiful Achievements. Until then, 